With the help of Congress, environmental groups, and industry, we will require all power plants to meet clean air standards in order to reduce emissions of sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxide, mercury and carbon, binoxide, carbon dioxide within a reasonable period of time. I was always suspicious. I figured that a smarmy oil tycoon wannabe wouldn't try to protect the environment. I do. Hey, I holler at my students, recycle that. They glower. Big deal, they say. Yeah, well, it's my planet. I want it to be nice. Your planet? Yeah, my planet. Yours too, so show some pride of ownership. Sometimes they think I'm joking, but I'm not. I'm trying to teach them by example to value something, to teach values. Off and on, there's a lot of talk about teaching values in schools. I'm sure that there are those who would accuse me of advancing a tree-hugging liberal agenda by trying to get my students not to shit where they eat. A lot of times, though, we think of our own political views as common sense. Those same detractors would probably appreciate that I try to get my students not to say things like shit where they eat. To them, it seems immoral for youngsters to talk like that. For me, as a language arts teacher, I appreciate the naughty metaphor, but want to help them move to a more sophisticated vocabulary and imagery and elocutionary oomph. To me, it's interesting to ask the question of whether I agree with those linguistic moral police. There is a subtlety here. Do we agree because we want the same results, or do we disagree because we want those results for different reasons? Er, kind of both, I think we want to answer. It's fun to put it in the form of a dialogue. I think we should stop global warming. No, you're wrong. We should stop global warming. When that oil tycoon became president, my skepticism turned to fear. Those fears proved well-founded when President Bush tried his hand at educational policy. The law is called No Child Left Behind, and it's meant to counter the soft bigotry of low expectations, as the president put it. Liberal Senator Ted Kennedy, no fan of President Bush, also supported NCLB. To him, it was a question of civil rights. The law is meant to ensure that all children in America not only have access to quality education, but that they are persuaded to learn. Education is often seen as a panacea for social problems like poverty. Kennedy believed that with a better education, all young people would have better chances for better jobs and brighter futures. He believed not only that America's public schools could make the lives of individual Americans better, but that they could make America a better country overall. But does he agree with the president? I don't think so. They both supported the law, but Bush's reasons may have been different. I think that the law shows the president's contempt for public education. Understanding this requires understanding the basic components of the law, accountability and basic skills testing. The basic skills testing part holds that we will avoid that soft bigotry of low expectations by, well, testing students' basic skills. The accountability part is that if the students don't test well, teachers get punished. Both of these are problematic. It is a conceit of teachers that our students are somehow other than us. In part, being other means that they like different things than us and that it's okay for us to ask them to do things that we wouldn't like. I find this highly suspicious. Richard Louvre wrote a long book called Last Child in the Woods, and for this book, he made up the term nature deficit disorder and said that kids have it. Nature deficit disorder sounds similar to attention deficit disorder, a disorder that we've heard about, and of course, we don't want our children to have disorders. The cure for nature deficit disorder, of course, is more nature. I think that the term is ridiculous, but I do like to work in my garden. In fact, I would find the term laughable, except Louvre himself is so earnest. He may be onto something, despite how ridiculous his disorder is. I know I get something essential out of working in my garden, something not to be had through books, not available in the traditional classroom. There is something primordial about planting, waiting, worrying about the weather, watching for the sun, about the primeval wanting of the seeds to sprout, something primitively satisfying to reaping what we've sown. I believe that there is intrinsic goodness in being connected to the earth, say, by cognizance of the food chain. Lots of things are intrinsically good. This is one that I value. If this is what I like, I think my students would likely like it too. Essential, primordial, intrinsic, 
None of these words used here means basic. Hey, Shot, what you up to? I'm taking pictures. Pictures of what? Uh, pictures of the plants here. I'm doing this project for one of my college classes. Aran is helping me with it. And why are the plants lined up like this? Why are they, you know, different heights and everything? Well, mm -hmm. if, you, if you take a look, the plants over in the shade are smaller, and the plants in the sun are larger, so I bet it's the morning sun coming over the building. Oh, so it's kind of like a passing of time. Good thing I recorded that. I like taking pictures, too. I asked Ariana to help me with these. She's a student of mine and a better photographer than me. Ariana is using inductive reasoning. I was proud of her for reaching that conclusion. I like Nick a lot, too. He's curious, just like me. Curiosity is something I value. Bob Spencer Michaels begins our report on the carbon dioxide story. Reducing carbon dioxide or CO2 emissions that result from power plants burning coal or natural gas became an issue during the presidential campaign. In a speech in Michigan last fall, candidate George W. Bush promised to work for cleanup of several gases including CO2. We must promote electricity and renewable energy. We will also work to make our air cleaner. With the help of Congress, environmental groups, and industry, we will require all power plants to meet clean air standards in order to reduce emissions of sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxide, mercury, and carbon, binoxide, carbon dioxide within a reasonable period of time. My opponent calls for voluntary reductions in such emissions. In Texas, I think we've done it better with mandatory reductions, and I believe the nation can do better as well. But yesterday, faced with fierce lobbying by conservative Republicans and some coal producers, the president reversed his position. I do not believe, wrote Mr. Bush, that the government should impose on power plants mandatory emissions reductions for carbon dioxide. Well, I was responding to, uh, uh, to reality. The president's reversal evoked anger and dismay from environmental groups who said the president had betrayed one of the few environmental pledges he had made. Groups of Democrats lined up Thank against the president's new policy. What concerns me more is not the fact that President Bush has abandoned his own cabinet secretaries. It's the fact that he has abandoned his commitment to leave no child behind. Because the real victims of global warming will be our children. About the only good thing about it is that it strips away any pretense of compassionate concern for the environment. This decision is particularly provocative because it involves an explicit campaign promise that was used on the campaign trail to blunt environmental criticism. We get more on the Bush reversal from Debbie Reed, Director of Legislative Affairs for the National Environmental Trust. So, Debbie Reed, what is the significance of the President's decision to reverse himself on this. Well, Gwen, I think it's very significant. The president campaigned on a commitment to bring integrity to the White House, but what good is his word now? Uh, this was the most significant environmental commitment um, made under the campaign, and the president walked away from it exactly 53 days. Were you really surprised? Um, yes, actually, we were very surprised. The president had this in his uh, campaign commitment, and uh, we've been hearing all the right signals from both him and from Christy Todd Whitman mm -hmm. on this. And I'm, I think it's very unfortunate that they have caved to special interest on this in just a matter of weeks. What do you think about that reversal? Is the president a man who could admit his mistakes, keep in touch with reality, make good decisions later to replace poor ones from before? Many people admire him and support his policies, and my role as a teacher isn't to change that. But I want students to be able to tell me, why? Because why is never simple in a complex world where someone tells you one thing and someone shows you another. Not knowing why is easy. But is it safe? 
So we have to ask, do we settle for being basic? Or do we want to read and watch and listen, learn with all our senses, evaluate, choose among options, make good decisions? Do we hold everyone back so no one is left behind, punish teachers instead of helping to educate kids? It's a complicated matter, but it's a simple decision.